and the players that we chose. It's a good time. And I think we are now ready to go. Getting used to the flow here. Kind of got started uh, a bit abruptly this morning for, for some people anyways, but we're finally ready to go. So I think we should go ahead and introduce the players of our own team. So Rod and M, you can take it away. I was actually quiet because I looked at the Terran main base. And I was like, that's all you zombie grub. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's my boy. That's my Terran. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the top right side of Hardwire, we're looking at the main base of our Brazilian, Dutch, American Terran player leading the charge for us. This is Calazur. In the bottom left is the green Protoss. We have Showtime. What he did a smashing job with those intros. Lovely seeing a little avatar square off and whatnot. And it seems like we're going to kick off in a relatively feisty manner as one of my children already sending out the boys, building a second barracks. I think we're going to get a little dirty here in the opening match of the entire cast of Civil War. I love it. I mean, I'm not really terribly surprised by this. First of all, Kelezer, he's uh, not exactly the most macro Terran that's ever lived. Always hey, no. throwing hey, in no. some cheeses. I'm giving him a compliment right now. He's always throwing in cheeses. That's just the way he is. He's a fun player, but also he's going to get smacked by Showtime if he doesn't cheese. So I was getting to the insult. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness, Zombie Grub. I tried to keep it <laughs> civil over here in the opening match, but if you want to play it like this, we're going to have to play it like this. Now let's see if Showtime and his phenomenal macro play is actually going to be capable of scouting this. Because if he doesn't scout this, I can only assume that we're going to get a couple of Marauders here. And we're supposed to get concussive shells, but I feel like lately there have been a couple of builds like this where they actually skip it out just to get an extra Marauder. But I guess that one is slightly different. Showtime does have a Zealot going on a little mission though. He's getting close, but not quite close enough. And I think that's kind of going to be the trend for your entire team. Throughout this season, Zombie Grub, take that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, as long as my trend isn't just one person winning and the rest of my team lagging behind. Like your team, Rotterdam. It's no, okay. No, we'll see <laughs> about that. Okay, now gloves are off. Zombie Grub's too early for this. I wanted to keep it nice. All right, let's see what this uh, Zealot is going to get done. With a little bit of micro, we should be able to pick this off. Now, Showtime sees three marines and that's the only thing he sees at this point as a protoss this could literally still be anything yeah this is actually still worrying for me to be honest the marauders are going to show up in the natural and that's going to create quite a panic there for showtime who's bullying the marines that's going well enough but as far as dealing with the push at the front that's where it gets a little bit tricky um even if there was a shield battery obviously that wouldn't have actually done much for very long so shield battery has to go up in that main base the goal here for showtime i mean really just hold that natural nexus which is going to take a long time to kill anyways but if he kind of lets the snowball then you know the nexus could definitely die yeah it is nice for him though that he keeps all the marines on the other side of the map because imagine if those five marines were here too then one void ray is actually not going to save your day at this point it's very obvious that kalazur at least needs to get to nexus and even if we then get the nexus i don't want to say that I'm in love with everything, but it's not bad. We do tag the Stalker, but there is a shield battery ah! that's going to try to save it, but it doesn't save it. Now let's get into that bunker. Let's do the SCV thing. Let's repair for a little bit and let's get that Nexus. Oh, it's going to be closed. Wow, that was good, actually. The hopping the low HP Marauder into the bunker. Yeah, kalazur has got some skills for sure. That that Nexus actually, I think, might go down. The probes are going to get pulled on. into this, I think, to help against no. the Marauders, figuring that the bunker is going to fall down. He goes for the free kill. Actually, he's just going to go mine. He thinks they can actually save this, but I'm not so sure. The Marauder, well, one of them goes down. The Marines jump in the bunker. The Nexus down in the red, and the probes get pulled out. Kill it. Oh, my God. The Void Ray just got killed, though. Oracle pops out instead to help, but that is seven, eight probe kills guaranteed. Yep, that Marauder picks one more off. And then this is already this is already a bit of a disaster for Showtime. As long as it keeps the Nexus alive, though, I could be okay with it. Yes, will this Oracle ever run out of energy? The answer is yes, it does run out of energy, so we can still micro a little bit. And look at the micro on these Marauders, and oh my goodness, a true Admiral right there. <laughs> now, this Nexus is very low in HP. The Stalker should be able to save it. But at this point, we have actually taken a little economic lead. We're going to make that economic lead a bit bigger. Let's hope we can deal with those Oracles at home. I'm just going to take a look at the defensive setup. So Stim has actually finished up from that proxy, which is big, because normally the big Ooh. downside of 
of builds like this is that Stim is very late, but we do need a couple of units to deal with these two <laughs> oracles. But technically, it's only one oracle, right? One other, the other oracle has nothing. Yeah, the other oracle is going to have like four seconds of energy, basically. Um, yeah, not even popping pulsar beam right now. Uh, okay, there we go, there we go. So, so SCVs are going to die in return just with the lack of production on this? this side of the map. This is not at all I predicted. The opening match to go, and actually we have some units back on the other side of the map going for the Nexus! No! Oh, no, 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 Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Oh, rigged. Okay, we're good, we're good. <laughs> Absolutely rigged. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, exactly as planned. <laughs> Excuse you. But oh my god. Mm. Oh, this is the one time I get to mention that Chrono Boosting increases shields a bit faster, so Chrono Boost that Nexus, I guess. The good news for oh Kalazur is though that we still have Steam, and at this point we already have four barracks, plus one is even halfway done. And all we really need to do, I kind of feel like, is getting a missile turret up in both bases, then we can start moving out again. And Showtime is going to have to defend quite a few Steam units with just two Oracles and basic gateway units. And let me tell you, from a place of a lot of experience on Microbe, it's very difficult. Yeah, I can believe that. I can definitely believe that. It's a bit of a shame. Showtime uh, not clearing up that barracks a bit faster might have been able to stop out combat shields. But it finished about 25% left on the uh, tech lab health. So it is what it is. But yeah, Kellas are now going to have a lot of bio units. Like, that high technology, right? He invested so much in a barracks. We're not talking about. Wood of mines or siege tanks or medevacs quite yet, but yeah, the number of bio units, that's going to be scary to control for Showtime. Mm -hmm. And Showtime decided to go for Blink as a follow-up, which obviously I don't hate, but I almost feel that by the time that Blink is done, I feel like these Terran bio units are already going to be knocking on his front door. The Oracle's very close to the Marines. That would have been an absolutely phenomenal pickoff for Kalazur, who does drop another command center. And that's actually uh, kind of interesting because I thought it'd be a little more YOLO here with those three barracks that he still had. But we're going to try to go up to three bases. Shoten does a good job in delaying that. The first push here is big. We throw down mm. a scan and we're going to take a look at where those shield batteries are at. I mean, the combination of shield battery, guardian shield and force fields is pretty terrifying. And this Terran army isn't really all that big, but it's not going to stop Kalazur from at least trying, but he doesn't get a whole lot done. And Showtime is starting to get a better and better setup for himself. He is, actually. I, I was quite... I was a lot more worried for the first push than I guess I had to be. I mean, kudos for Showtime for putting that, that shield battery where he did. That's not exactly uncommon anymore, but just making sure to cross his, his T's type of deal. Um, but then I just actually thought that'd be a lot more stuff. That really wasn't too bad. And Kellys are going for a third CC. Really does limit his options as far as mid-game harassment goes, because that means it further delayed his starport. I mean, this is oh. really late medevax. This was such a bizarre way to kick this entire little battle off. Kellys <laughs> got so close, and if only those Marines were there a split second earlier, and they would have been able to pick up that Oracle a bit quicker or the Void Ray. It's still a game. There is still hope, but if you look at the economy, it's not obviously starting to look better and better for the grubba lubba dub dubs in Showtime here, taking a 15 worker lead, stabilizing on three bases, also getting the second Robo and the Robo Bay. Well done by Mr. Mauer, so. Yeah, well done on the recovery, because that's a. Uh, without the Nexus, man. I mean, maybe. <laughs> maybe still recoverable if the. The little hit squad killed it because it's a little bit later, but even that I think would have been enough to actually send Showtime uh, on the back foot for an extended period of time. Easily up till 9 or 10 minutes. Now we're at 9 minutes, double Robo pumping out Colossus. We got Charge on the way, plus one. I mean, I find this very comfortable for, for Showtime in particular. Um, I guess I had to be a little worried about the early game, but now that that's over, I feel like Showtime is in his wheelhouse. Good job, Dabba Kalazura spots the Observer immediately, so that is something, but... Showtime is an absolute master in games like this, where he can get the setup going that he wants. He's starting to get some vision on the left side, observers keeping track of that big bio army. And by the time that Kalazur is going to be capable of truly fighting Showtime, he's not just going to fight a couple of Blink Stalkers and Sentries anymore. He's going to have to deal with a lot of Robo units. And especially, at, I think Showtime should have maybe squeezed in one Immortal by now, because Kalazur is actually very Marauder heavy, and you don't want to rely only on Colossus if you're going up against a guy with this many. Marauders, but who am I yeah. to second guess Mr. Mauer? I guess he knows what he's doing. I guess, yeah. We can kind of trust him. I do 
love the addition of uh, immortals. Like one early on sometimes is kind of a part of the process if you're going up against a three rack, something like that. But then later on, maybe after you've gotten three Colossus, like four or five disruptors, I've actually liked adding in a couple of immortals. But from what I've seen from Showtime, I don't think he ever really does that. He's definitely um, on the straight and narrow as far as that robo build, which is usually three Colossus into disruptors and then just kind of bullying with the Colossus range, macroing back at home, uh, generally, you know, good mid to late game protoss. He's actually going up to four and now a fifth. OK, yeah, that was a bit too much. But four Colossus instead of maybe a more standard three, then I'm sure into disruptors. But this is going to give him that little bit extra splash as long as he takes these fight and chokes, uh, which I assume that he will because he's got that army constantly scouted. He should be good to actually engage. Yep, well, he blinks forward even. That's a little bit adventurous. Kalazur saw that a little late, so he's going to end up losing the medevac immediately. A few marauders. Basically, at this point, we are relying on our hit squad at the bottom left to do a lot of damage. We're going to YOLO spec 420. A couple of units into the natural. There is a big zealot weapon. I want to say maybe we can get the prison, but there are barely any marines there. So I don't oh. think we're going to get the prison. We might be able to unpower the robots for a split second. <laughs> but Nexus. all of these units are going to go down. Yeah, the Nexus is still a target. He's been trying to get this Nexus all <laughs> game long, and I don't think he's going to get it this time either. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, great. I was a little worried. I was like, Showtime, you going to react to this? Because he definitely saw the run by yeah, the piling up there. But then he recalled over to the fourth and I was like, oh, no, <laughs> maybe the Nexus is a target. But obviously, even if it killed the Nexus, you know, no escape for all of those units was always, I think, going to be too costly. Now we have the Medivacs in the main. I mean, I'm, I don't I feel like they really shouldn't commit, you know, maybe pick up, like hang around. OK, but yeah, Kylozer can't. Uh, can't find any damage right now, so I think getting back on macroing back at home, making sure he has something that actually stands up to Showtime's true army, the one with Colossus, a little more important. Yeah, but actually this might not be the worst moment ever to fight. The Archons were a little bit out of the party. We get on top of a Colossus. We almost get that War Prism. But what I do like about the weird hit squad of Kalazur and the drop is that he bought a lot of time for his goals to enter the battlefield. Because without goals, these Archons would actually be very good. And the, the combination of Archon Colossus is almost impossible to fight with just buy units. Because of the random hit squad, we got a couple of goals out. And now we can land a few tiny MPs. We don't have the upgrade yet. And it gives us... You know, the, the slightest hope, not a whole lot. Shotam has no armor, by the way, so that also gives me a little bit of hope because we have plus two on bio now. Good point, too. Yeah, that, that was almost a big mistake there from Showtime, who really was walking into an army that, with that many Marauders, with any amount of Concave, could absolutely take on three Colossus as kind of mm. barely defended as they were. Fortunately, for my sake, they didn't actually go down. And Showtime has built up a lot more of that fodder. Now, the Archons will get popped super quickly by these EMPs. If they actually hit, that is, two of the Archons still fresh as when they were born, man. The Sentry's got those force fields down, and this was just a clobbering. This actually wasn't even close. Yeah, a really good fight there by Showtime. Perfect force builds. Makes it very hard. Even if Kalazur tries to pick up the units, he's going to lose a couple of medevacs with bio inside of it. Uh, I was hoping that maybe the EMPs would have a big impact there, but I kind of felt that Kalazur needed a few more Vikings. He wasn't totally ready for that fight. Maybe the previous skirmish gave him some confidence that this fight would also go well, but this time around it did not go very well. It was close. Diego almost bringing it home against showtime and i think that would have been a surprise for a lot of people but it seems that the grubba lava dub ducks are gonna take the one zero lead here zombie grub and looks that way showtime just needs to clean up the rest of this army with four colossus still alive one tries to be targeted down even that doesn't actually die oh there we go finally going down um this will be a cleanup gg showtime takes game one up for the grubble of dub dubs that is something that we were expecting so if kelazar had actually done the proxy killed that nexus got rid of a uh, really throwing a wrench into our plans I, I love the build i love the build i love the execution i also think showtime did a very good job with his initial stalker and his zealot because if those are just walking around on his side of the map and then the marines can very easily join up with those marauders i actually think it would have been a very uncomfortable defense because then a void ray is suddenly not that good anymore that void ray won't just be able to kill multiple marauders and the bunker so well done but you know what zombie grub it's a community event. Nobody likes a 5-0. We don't even like a 5-0. We didn't want to do that to you guys. So I am happy that uh, there is a point on the board. Still full of confidence. Thanks, man. Really means a lot to me. You let me have one point on the board. I, uh, 
I don't know if it'll stay at one, though. Our next match, I think, is exactly yeah. the matchup that you were hoping we wouldn't uh, force you into, which is Max Pax versus Hero Marine. That is exactly what we wanted. Oh, okay. All right. No. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot disclose state secrets, Zombie Grub, but uh, maybe it wasn't totally what we were hoping for, what we were expecting. But I mean, this is a historically, this is a big matchup, right? Something we see very often on the Monday night. For a while, it was all Hero Marine, then one time Max Pax, then more Gabe. And then at one point, Max Pax actually started to do very well against Gabriel. Until Gabriel, I feel like, realized it was Monday again and he got very upset and started to get a few more points on the board. But these two, I feel like they rarely fail to deliver. It's normally always exciting and close. So I think it's anybody's game. There was a really, I think it was, it was an 0-2 and then Max Pax almost fought it back against Hero Marine in game three. That was actually really sick. And in fact, I think he won that and he took it to a game four. Yeah. So a lot of their recent encounters have actually been 3-1, so I'm not even sure which Open Cup I'm even thinking of. Um, but it has been Hero Marine still relatively dominant, but that is the thing about these best of fives with, with no ace matches, is that you look at the history and you're like, well, they've taken one game. That's all they have to do mm -hmm. here. So I'm always worried, but I don't know if Hero Marine's really worried. I feel like he's confident. <laughs> I had a little chat with Gabe yesterday. He seemed pretty confident. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think that is warranted considering their history. But let's see how it actually shakes out because that last one started off with some fireworks. We'll see what this one does in the bottom left. So I'm coming in first for the grub -a, a dub dubs and mouse. He's here, Marine. And in the top right side of 2k atmosphere, we are down 0-1, so we need the prince to do his magic. We are looking at the main base of my second round draft pick. It is Max Pax. Yeah, no one blamed you for that second round pick. I personally, when I was actually like truly evaluating, not just like BMing and shit talking, um, I actually really wondered if Max Pax was as strong as the second pick as, as people were giving him credit for. I think it was like understandable, like everyone kind of nodded their head. They were like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But especially with the patch having rolled in, I was like, ah, I don't know. How is this going to work out? But supposedly Max Pack's doing pretty okay with the new patch. Yeah, yeah, I'm not ultra worried about the patch, but but I agree. There were just a lot of good potential players to still pick, obviously. But I had a very late second round draft pick, right? So it's not like I was able to get a Gabe or I was able to get, uh, you know, Rogue or whatever. Cure. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, cause I was, I took second place in the free for all, which meant that my <laughs> second round draft pick was number seventeen or something among those lines. So, yeah, uh, or fifteen. Oh, so of course it took a while, but I always hoped that I was able to get max packs, just because this tournament is not all. Well, obviously it is about winning and mostly about beating Benny and the boys, but it's also yes. just about getting excited <laughs> over your players and getting excited over games and. If I, uh, if I think to myself, who has given me more fun games over the last year when I'm just casting from home, it's very hard to come up with a different name than Max Pack. So I'm super happy to have him on board and I'm sure that he's going to do very well for the Admirals. I'm not even doubting him. All right, then. Uh, you know, after this, I'll be cheering for your team, Roddy. So let's just, oh. you know, advance that and say, I hope he does very well. But not right now. He can I'll admit, die. Zombie Grub, as soon as it's over, I love your team. You know I love your team. You've got my favorite <laughs> Russians as well. They're super cool. So it's a, And obviously Gabe. It's, it's impossible not to love Gabe. So it will be very fun to follow your journey in the upcoming matches. But one point is enough for now, Zombie Grub. Let's keep it at that. As Gabe picks off a probe there, that's a bit unlucky. It's a bit lucky. I think that's uh, <clears throat> what you meant. It's uh, pretty good. So... My, like, I, even if it wasn't Hero Marine, even if it was another one of my Terrans, maybe not Euthermal, who's uh, quite quite struggling versus Protoss nowadays, but still, I just, I've always looked at Max Pax's PVT as extremely fun and extremely abusive in a very good way the later the game gets. So I think he's very intimidating in the late game. But as far as the, like, let's say mid game, like the um, point you're on two bases, let's put it that way. I don't know, I've always felt like he he's a little, not one dimensional, but almost like th three dimensional would make any sense. I feel like he has three builds, right? He's got a four gate that he dedicates to and then tries to macro out of sometimes. And then he's got like a dark shrine build 
And then only occasionally do I feel like I actually see him go for it's, you know, a two gate fast third expand, for instance, which maybe he is going to do this game. But that four gate has, hasn't really been working out for him nearly as well. I don't know if you've noticed a change because maybe I haven't cast him recently. Yeah, I, I do agree with you uh, about the late game. He's obviously very good with a bunch of zealots and DTs running around everywhere. And that's where he can make life a living hell, even for someone like Gabe. The one thing that is nice about Max Pax in a weird way is that he's not ultra greedy in this matchup. So Gabe is the absolute king of not a whole, uh, whole lot happening in a game. And then one big Gabe push and it's all over because he's so good at tank positioning and knowing when to commit with a little drop to really make sure the Protoss falls apart and he can get where he wants to be, whether it's the second base or the third base. That's nice, by the way. Adept sneaks into the main base. We're going to let the Shade finish up so we get a good scout off. We see no Viking, no Raven, no Cyclone. So at this point, I think we can be pretty damn certain this is a Hellion drop. Excuse me, I wouldn't mind drop. And that's going to be nice for Max Pax. But yeah, Max Pax doesn't really go up to like 80 probes and 4 bases without at least winning one skirmish. So I don't think Gabe is just going to be able to do his big Gabe thing against him. Well, Max Pax is once again four gating, which I mean, if he Here Marine has to, I think I'm pretty sure Here Marine's picked up on the same thing. It doesn't mean that he always wins against it, as, as seen by the best of fives. No, uh, the game, but <gasps> no, 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 no. Oh my goodness. Oh, I mean, yes, <laughs> yes, Here Marine. I don't know why was that such a surprise. That's really weird. Yes, it is really weird, and that is very, very, very painful because that's often all that Gabe really needs. Well, let's hope the Stalkers deal a lot of damage on the other side of the map, but you look at the setup of Hero Marine, he's got two tanks, he's got a bunker. This is turning into a bit of a disaster, Zombie Group. Yeah, that's uh, maybe some maybe some jitters, actually. You know, getting used to playing on his own, maybe not as used to playing for a team. I don't know, it's, uh, it was very odd, but the Stalkers, they still have a chance. It doesn't feel like a very strong chance. Even that tank on the high ground getting one shot significantly weakens so many of those stalkers. The bio can chase after them. I mean, decent attempt to save, you know, a couple of the weak ones, but I, I, yeah, the, the options are already significantly too limited for Max Pax, who just can't overwhelm with the stalkers. He can hardly even, like, multi prong, could try and go for some of the SCVs, but with a Viking out, that's extremely dangerous. Yeah, this this is not looking very pretty. We get the Reaper, and that's not something you get very excited over. The Stalker is Stalker as well. Please pick it up. Ooh, he does no. pick it up, but he ends up losing the War Prism, and that's going to make life even worse. We're going to re the Prism immediately. There is a Dark Shrine, 70 80% done. And Hero Marine did end up losing the two Widow Mines as the Medivac is trying to sneak back into the natural from the right side. So Gabe is not totally aware of the DTs, but right when I say that, he drops a missile turret, drops two missile turrets. It's going from bad to worse. Yeah, I just, I really feel like Max Pax almost has something to prove with the four gate. It feels like he really thinks that it's going to be a good enough build that he can both harass, uh, potentially straight up win too, and then also potentially macro out of. Um, but it, it really hasn't even gotten close to being able to macro out of it the last few times that I've seen it. Um, it's it's gone quite poorly actually, and uh, this would actually be up against here, Marine. Oh, this would have been such a good moment to just YOLO into the natural, especially now that a scan has been used as well on the other side of the map. Maybe we can get take care of a couple of these turrets. The DT runs into the bunker. I feel like Max Pax just had no idea that the real army of uh, Hero Marine wasn't home yet. Now he finally picked up on that, so he blinks forward. We have a Prism in the main base, getting a couple of SCVs, and then we're going to try to pick up that turret in the natural, but we don't kill it before we lose our DT. And there is still a big army of Gabriel on the other side of the map. I think one scan is available, and Gabe is just oh, going to spin left. forward. Oh, okay. Yep, there you go. So two power, two gateways he powered and destroyed. Dark Shrine is going to be able to be destroyed too. Uh, how many scans are we talking about? Actually, only one more as he used one defensively. So this could be a little awkward. One DT is stuck in the corner. So Max Pax is going to try and lengthen this game out by throwing one DT at a time. I'm personally very familiar with this theory. I'm not sure it's going to work to a, a game winning degree, but it, it will lengthen the game. Not, not by a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> GG gets caught. It's that first Widow Mind drop that gets 11 kills. I thought that the Adept getting into the main base was excellent because if you don't see the Cyclone, you don't see a Viking or anything else, it is so, so, so likely that it's going to be a Widow Mind drop. And we technically had the units to, to deal with this and, and whatnot. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh. Well, that was another one. I feel, I feel like 
I feel bad now, <laughs> but it's like it's the it's the two that we pretty much almost guaranteed. Let's put it that way. I think the three, the next three are very up in the air. Uh, obviously, like I gave Rainer kind of just victory on all of his matches. I don't know if that's actually going to be true, of course, but I assume that Rainer is actually going to win. Raditz has some, he's got some tricks though. He's got some tricks, but you know, this one, Harson versus Thermal. Yeah, uh, Uthermal's been streaming a little bit, and uh, he's been facing Harsum a decent amount on that stream. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the the wins ain't going to Uthermal too often, is what I'll say about that. It's, so don't uh, despair. I call it the Dutch uh, Klassieker, or El Clasico, as they would say it in Spanish, because Harsum and Uthermal have been the two best players in the Netherlands for such a long time. But I feel like it always goes in waves between these two, right? There and definitely have been moments where Uthermal beats up on Harstam quite a bit. Then suddenly it's Harstam's time and then Harstam starts beating Uthermal a couple of times in a row. And then it's, it's really 50-50 for a little while. So it seems that lately Harstam has done all right and maybe in some of those latter games. But, uh, I don't know, I'm pretty... It's always scary for me because I look at Harstam and Uthermal. They have both been phenomenal for such a long time. I feel like it's almost as 50-50 as it gets. Like, we know they can both beat one another. But at this point, I really need to get the captain to get one on the board. Because obviously, <laughs> if we go down 0-3, then you guys have already won the opening match. And yeah, that would, that would be, be very unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I would not mind. I would not mind. Uh, but yes, I agree with your assessment, uh, usually. If I had gone in this without talking to you, Thermal, or well, well, without watching his stream, I would totally be like 50-50, and then, you know, you throw him on a best of one, let's like say that he has a, a good chance for a pretty brutal, like, cheese or just very risky strategy to work out. But, uh, with the... Other experience, I guess, anyways. Uh, yeah, Euthermal, he's having, been, uh, he's having a tough time. We'll see if he got maybe some strategies from Big Gabe or something like that. He can bring in another win, get us the clean 3-0. He's spawning in the bottom left of Glittering Ashes. It's Euthermal. And in the top right side, we're looking at the main base of the man who's playing on the account, the Cowboy. But obviously, we all know him as one of our captains. It is Harstam. The captain, the admiral. Come on, the boys. We need it. I mean, he is the captain, but uh, he's up against the captain of the Gravel Dub Tubs. <laughs> but that's the that's the tagline that I've been going with, uh, hyping up this match. Uh, but uh, seriously, it's going to be tough for you, Thermal. I do. I, I'll reveal the secrets now. So my team, I guess, hasn't been talking as much as yours <laughs> by the sounds of it. But they've been chatting. I think they're all very confident, actually. There's been very little discussion because basically people are like this or this. And otherwise, I'm not really um, opinionated. And then everyone else kind of agrees. And it's it's like, boom, it's done. But uh, you, Thermal, has been asking for, you know, some uh, tips, I suppose. And here, Marine did say he was like, just straight up 3cc against Harsum. I, I almost never lose with it. And it doesn't feel like something that Euthermal would necessarily be known for doing, because he's always about like this early game tank pushes, early game proxies, something like that. But I do wonder if he'll give it a go, since he's been having trouble against Harsum otherwise. I've seen Euthermal play a lot with Banshees in this matchup lately. And that is something that I thought maybe I should sneak in there. But obviously, if I know it, then I can only assume that Harsum knows it too. And I know that they also meet one another on the ladder and i'm really worried that if i'm like hey man benchies benchies and then suddenly it's like three wrecks and you know he's getting ready for benchies the three wrecks is like a truck and i'm like no why did i get involved so i i didn't really talk about it but most of the time when i see you thermal stream lately or whenever i tune in i i feel like almost every game against protos he's having a good time with a couple of benchies and harstam is opening up with the stargate here now that could be because it's a big map and stargates are very good on glittering ashes but it could also be because he has also seen you thermal be very annoying and be yeah. very successful with the benchies yeah i guess we've been seeing kind of the opposite games though where it's like i don't know if i saw any banshees when i was checking on his stream for maybe like a couple of hours but with the protoss in the european region being as it is that was like 80 percent tvps but it is more so to the Hero Marine credit here. I, I gotta believe this is actually directly from their very brief conversation in my Discord, because otherwise, yeah, Euthermal, much more well-known for other things, odd playstyles, aggressive playstyles. Mm -hmm. A 3cc against a, a, a Protoss player can be kind of labeled like an eco-cheese, if you will, but that's not necessarily fair. Like, it, it's definitely not what Euthermal would usually do. Question is, did Harslam expect this at all? Of course, he'll scout it eventually with the Phoenix. But for now, he doesn't actually quite know what's going on. 
And what I'm a bit worried about is that some Phoenix players, they actually like to keep the first Phoenix at home, right? Because they want to be like, okay, just in case they go for a Widow Mind drop or there is a Banshee, then I'm going to get the home run, the slam dunk. I'm going to kill everything without losing anything. That would be bad. But the good news for Harstam in a weird way is that there are two Reapers heading towards his natural. So I feel that then it's okay to reveal the Phoenix because it's very likely that these Reapers are going to reveal the fact that you have Phoenixes anyway. And then hopefully he will still see that Euthermo is indeed playing in a very economic manner. At this point, we're still hiding it, and I'm not really feeling that. Yeah, the Phoenix took a little while, but does come in, see everything. I mean, don't have okay. to see the third CC necessarily. He sees no second gas. He sees the timing of the factory. That's enough information. And uh, we'll see how he plays from beyond that. I do think Euthermo was really hoping the Adepts were going to try and pair up. Um, or at least one of them will be on the other side of the map, maybe awkwardly walking back home. So his Reapers could have done more damage. They walk right into the Adept, didn't really work out that way. And of course the Scout no longer necessary. But still, this means that Euthermal does get to get away with his build. He's not going to be totally punished. The Phoenix might be able to pick up some SCVs here and there, but by the looks of things, not even that. It's using some of the incredible resource collection right now for the Terran to invest in the Missile Turrets. Makes a lot of sense. I am kind of happy that uh, Yehasim at least went up to 3 next side relatively quick. I feel like he even did it a bit quicker than maybe I would uh, suggest to the average Protoss player on the ladder. But hey, the captain is an expert, so I'm sure that he knows what he can get away with and not. But I think there were a couple of openings that would have actually been very problematic, and he wasn't necessarily certain that it was the triple CC build. So we're gonna go Phoenix Zealot. Phoenix Zealot is always very funny against uh, these kinds of builds. If you win the first fight, life is beautiful if you lose one fight as phoenix zealot player it basically is all over because at that point the terran economy just becomes too big and there is too much firepower in the terran army oh my god yeah. you're almost actually moving out already beef wow that's crazy that is actually crazy the good news is harstom with his consistent phoenix usage is going to be able to scout the severe lack of army so again his actual harassment has been quite limited thanks to the missile turrets but scouting you still get that done so he is trying to race back home he's trying to build a shield battery he's What's gonna you? actually scout this in the nick of time actually yeah you thermal even backing away i think was the right call if he'd gotten there like two seconds sooner i think mm -hmm. he stimmed the win but yeah for now things are uh, calming down these units are going to have a relatively hard time getting home. And I actually think for the Terran, it's very important that the bio ball grows. But maybe Yutomo just wants to take one little fight before our charge is done. Charge is almost done. I think he should really go home. But obviously, I would love to see him stick around just a little bit longer. Careful with the Phoenix there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. Euthermo was playing with fire. Uh -oh. Decent time to return home, though. It's not like the Phoenix can can chase this down as effectively as they had actually taken a fight. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I still don't like that the Marines necessarily are taking the fight here. They're going to run back home at this point, but getting a couple of Phoenix, uh, I'd be a lot more worried if there was like a War Prism, but we're fine. Mm -hmm. That wasn't too bad for you, Thurman. It wasn't also too ugly for Harstam, but I do think losing two Phoenixes is always kind of a big deal, especially because he is still building Phoenixes, so he truly relies on these Phoenixes to keep him safe later on against drops and also be able to hunt down armies, and that just doesn't really work when you have a very small number of Phoenix. So losing two of those expensive boys ain't too pretty, but getting all the Marines is very pretty. Let's not lose another one. We don't. We just get two SUVs. One Colossus, and I uh, I think we're golden. That's kind of how I look at this game. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. You thermal not getting, I, I think, as much of a jump start as I was maybe hoping. Uh, now, as far as, like, you thermal's TVP, um, I, I don't know his particular feelings on it, other than he constantly makes fun of himself for it. Um, but as far as, like, do you think he's weak in the early, mid, late game? But my perception has always been that I never really... Like, when Euthermal's early game builds work, it's beautiful. It's maybe one of the easiest victories that he's had. Otherwise, they kind of, like, hamstring him, and then he doesn't look so hot in the mid or late game. But his control and his, like, instinct in the mid and late game is not terrible. So it's not that I'm scared that he's, you know, getting into the late game versus Harsome. Um, but I still feel like we're going to have a brief moment here where he can't quite do enough damage. Then we're going to get into, like, late, late game. We're going to have DT still blinking around even after the patch. And that's when I'm quite worried for Euthermal. Mark actually left a lot of units in his main base, so this initial war prism that would be very good if there are no buy units here. It's not going to get a whole lot done, but I do like that Harsom doesn't just sacrifice it. I don't know why we're building two Templar archives on Big Rup, and they're also right next to each other. And that is not something that I, I hopefully he realizes. 
After Obviously. sometimes when one finishes up, you're like, hey, wait a minute. I don't need this other building. That's a lot of gas. It's a very expensive building gas-wise. And if we want to play double Robo and Archons and Phoenix and upgrades, we kind of need that gas. No. I would agree with you. I think it'll be okay. But it's, it's obviously a mistake. It's obviously a mistake. Entire High Templar now gone. And uh, not, not much use in Double High Templars either. Templar archives. Maybe one gets sniped. But I think actually you thermal is going for a very brute force punch to the the gut. I don't think he's really necessarily going to be going for a lot of drops or a lot of snipes. There's one thing that Euthermal has going for him besides the amount of siege units that he's built up, and that is the equal upgrades. The Cardinal's player did not get ahead of him here, but that's, you know, that's obviously not, not super big for an upgrade lead. That is a very gnarly spot for tanks to siege, especially if they're backed by Liberators. We do have Zealots counterattacking, but they are not getting a whole lot done because Euthermal has the Hero Marine bunker. Uh, Patience is the virtue at this point for the Admirals, for Harstam, as he is getting his first Disruptors on the way. And if we can just land one Nova, it could really change yeah. the momentum of this entire clan war, I like to call it. <laughs> Even though I we're not a clan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to clan war. It's just the easiest thing to say. Unfortunately, it looks like Euthermal wasn't aware of the Observer or thought that it had chased his main army more than it did. Flies over an Adept as well. Uh, does use the position to uh, reposition, I guess, as Harsum briefly sent his units to the left side. This is not necessarily the best fight for Harsum. Actually a bit confused as to why he kept running in there. Nothing to kill the Liberators. It's like the Colossus are really getting a ton of great shots. Oh my goodness, and Arsum's taking a very bad fight in the top side of the map as well. Euthermal did a great job there in putting all those Marines in the choke point. Arsum is taking more and more of a beating. Does land one Nova to soften up that tank a little bit, and we will be able to pick up the second tank. But we need to spend all our money. Now, yeah, I'd love to see the Phoenixes work on that Liberator on the left side. I mean, Euthermal's just playing a great game, but maybe getting a little over eager here as he's running into those Colossus shots. Yeah, I was going to say the tanks could be moved up a little bit. He's still relatively safe, but the Liberator is still in play. They are weakened. And he's not paying attention. No! Oh, oh, the Nexus does get taken down, but that is a lot of supply to lose. And the natural is held on Harsum's side. Um, that was brutal. That was a brutal disruptor shot. But I think Euthermal still has a uh, decent stance. He can get his reinforcements over here. He could probably even keep this. He's trying to get that Phoenix over on the left side. A little micro battle going on right there. Um, uh, Euthermal has done a great job against the Phoenix. Now he even picks up those last few Marines as well and he's going to send them towards the main army. That is all from that initial army in the top side that already picked up three or four Phoenix and more than a handful of Zealots. But now that matter of fact, he still goes down with the Marines inside of it. So Harsten finally catches a break. We're going to try to send another Nova. I almost feel like we just want to avoid this setup forever, man. This is yeah. impossible to run into unless we've got a very sweet zealot engagement. But I don't really feel like we have the right amount of units. But Euthermal is going to be caught off guard here a little bit. He's going to turn a couple of the Liberators around. Can the zealots make the difference? Extra buy units coming in from the back. It's getting wild, but it's starting to look really good for Harstam. Yeah, absolutely. He really put you thermal between the rock and a hard place, like somewhat literally, right? The red, like the whole army was coming in from the <laughs> south, and then disruptors were up to the north. And unfortunately, you thermal. I mean, hindsight 2020, but that that was a really hard engagement to kind of figure out while you were getting surrounded. But again, maybe having seen it, changing his liberators wow. immediately and letting the disruptors come in from the backside might have been the better call. As it is, that was way too much armor to to lose. A really sweet army movement, beautiful rotation by Harstam. I didn't even expect that to go that well. I figured that there is a way that we can maybe win the fight, but didn't expect him to ever win it so convincingly. Very well done. Did, of course, still end up losing that Nexus. Lost all of his Phoenixes. Lands another Nova there, so he picks up one more tank. Uh, that was beautiful to keep us in this clan war. I mean, that was not tournament live on the line, but that was our first 500 bucks on the line, <laughs> at least for the boys. Awesome is gonna blink forward now, get on top of this planetary fortress, lands a couple Novas, will be able to kill the PF, and is that the only Ghost Academy? No, why do we have two Ghost Academies? Same reason we have two uh, Templar archives, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to even things out, Roddy, even things out. Mm. Euthermal is not gonna go down without a fight, but losing that fourth base is way too much. I mean, even if he took the fight of his life, like perfect surround, it probably would not be enough. E even upgrades, but he's the one down in army supply. Uh, it would require something more. It would require Parsum, I don't know, losing all of his disruptors because they were mishotkeyed or something. 
That was once more such a beautiful rotation. I am stunned with how well that went. I actually think if the Euthermal would have been able to bring over those bio units just a bit quicker, then the Zealots are going to have a way tougher time getting on top of the tanks. And it could have all been over by now. Instead, suddenly the captain is maxed out. You throw most at 157 supply. And he just doesn't really have the Terran army that's capable of engaging this kind of a Protoss army. Yeah, exactly. Agreed. Reinforcements would have been nice. And also not had taken that Disruptor shot. You know, having 12 Marines and 2 Marauders or whatever it was yeah. actually would have been a lot when it came to dealing with the Zealots that jump on top of the tanks. But, uh can't exactly go back in time here so you thermal is going to try and at the very least get maxed out uh his fourth phase is going to be replanted there is a chance here that you thermal gets a good enough army that if he takes a miracle engage he could win the game but it's going to require a very good engagement it's going to leapfrog off of and that's going to be difficult to do against someone who still has disruptors on the front line yeah parsima obviously doesn't really need to be here without a war prism and i don't see okay there is a war prism out on the map or is the prism correct it's in the center, so we can actually reinforce. That is very nice, because sometimes you can take an ugly fight, but then all you need is 10 extra zealots just to keep those marauders at bay to prevent those guys from st uh, stemming forward and getting on top of your colossus. So I actually think we're playing this out in a beautiful manner. Of course, your thermos economy is not as good as it once upon a time was, so I don't think we have to be worried about, you know, 20 Vikings suddenly showing up and those ripping apart the colossus. Nah, and I mean, you Thermal's actually already injured coming into this fight, so... Obviously the EMPs kind of do ditto for the Protoss army, but the Medivacs have a hell of a job trying to track the army and then actually heal all of this bio. Getting kind of clumped up as well. It's definitely not terrible fights on the side of you Thermal, and if you get rid of some of these Colossus, I take away a lot of that kind of freebie damage as you Thermal runs away, but then you still have the rest of the army, you still have the Disruptors, and coming in here with maybe like a... Like a 180 concave. I don't know if that's going to be enough, but that's exactly what you Thermal is going to try and come in here with. Two disruptor shots actually hitting too much and beautiful dodges out of the rest of the disruptor shots mm -hmm. as well. Hot oh, diggity damn, not a bad fight at all for you Thermal, but he's oh. already coming in here. Oh, he actually snipes the War Prism. The Colossus are not going to go down by the looks of things, however, and there's only a limited amount of bio on the floor. War Prism not being involved might have you Thermal hold the line for now, but again at a significant disadvantage. I have to say that that was godlike army control by Euthermal. Honestly, I don't think he could have done a whole lot better there. But the army that he had, the amount of units that he had, the way that he avoided all the Novas, the way he's still avoiding the Novas, the way he's chasing this army down now, I am very happy that Harsim is ultra rich, picking up that prism right before that Zealot Warp in finished up as well. Euthermal, honestly, 10 out of 10 performance there in that fight. I am very happy that it's not going to be good enough, and I'm very happy that most likely my boys will get a point on the board, but I am in awe of how well Yutomo controlled his units there. Yeah, that's not, the, uh, that's not the first time, man. It feels like he does go Super Saiyan against Disruptors, uh, but the odds are already against him, so it doesn't really matter. Um, he's going to try and, and maybe make this a bit of a more complicated game. I think he knows that his move out on the right is probably going to lose him something on the left, but you kind of have to commit to it. You just have to make the game crazy, trying to constantly defend. He's eventually going to get you killed, but attacking is not really going to work out either. GG. Come on, the boys. We're still in it. Let's go, Harstam. Let's go. Ah, it's a good attempt. Good attempt. Yeah, great game. Actually, so far, this has been really fun because uh, the first game obviously was incredibly close between Diego and Showtime. And now uh, this one with our life on the line, at least for this clan war, that rotation, sneaking around, still go keeping everything together, getting on top of the tanks. Yutomo played good though, I, I hands head off. Like Yutomo actually played very well this game. Yeah, two things really could have changed the, uh, the tides there. One, the early Marines getting up on that ramp <laughs> could have actually created very, uh, very awkward game. And then two, had the Disruptor shot plus the reinforcements, I guess, for that final fight. And then I don't think the Zealots get on top of the tanks. The tanks blast away the uh, the siege units that are trying to come up here, the Colossus, the Disruptors. And then uh, Euthermal might not win right then and there, but it's a lot more even from then on. And then you can showcase some of that great micro. But already being 30 supply down, it's, uh, it's pretty impossible for anyone. But that's okay. It's okay. We're still at 2-1. <laughs> the Discord is popping off. We're celebrating like we've already won the entire clan war. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, so next up is uh, our ZVZ between my captain, well, one of my five captains that I picked in the first round, Raynor, the best performing player of the previous season of the Castle Civil War, or the Warchest Team League, as it was called back then. 
going up against a bit of a wild card. Somewhat scary, I have to admit. I am always a little bit scared, especially in a best of one. Because Vanya or Ratata is obviously feisty. But I, th I think we can all agree that Rainer is the f Rain Rainer is pretty good. Rainer is pretty good. Um, I'm I'm really not too worried for Rainer in actually any of his matches. I mean, there's always a ch like, you know, he wasn't doing particularly well leading up to Katowice, so there's always that chance maybe he's, like, not on his hot streak, I guess. But, you know, I think Rogue, it can be really hit or miss. I still think Rainer is as dependable, almost as dependable as a Serral. So if Radita gets this, I don't know. I'm going to buy him a steak dinner next time I see him. <laughs> All right, who are we on top of first? Okay, bottom right for the Gullbub Dub Dubs. We got Radita. And that, of course, means that in the bottom left side of Blackburn, we're looking at the main base. Oh, my captain. He said, don't worry, I will hard carry in this entire league. All right, mate, show me what you got. It's Raynor. You can only hard carry so much when you're <laughs> one best of one. Hey, if he, if he wins all of his games, I will consider that as a hard carry. I'm not worried. Yeah. I do agree with some of the chatter in uh, Twitch chat, which is that I do think that of all of our players, Radata is kind of the, the snipiest one. So him going up against Raynor, it, it kind of works twofold, I think, for us, which is that Radata, like, he's been very uh, realistic, I guess, about his, his chances and, like, where he should slot in on the team, which is that he absolutely can win, but maybe he, you know, he's not going to say, like, oh, I'm going to win 100%, like maybe here, Marine said today. So we get... <laughs> to actually like get our player who maybe we don't expect like all that much of, but we know can do it, kind of facing your star player. Um, so yeah, I am kind of saying we're, we're, it's almost a sacrificial lamb situation, but then with the added benefit of Radata actually being like a really uh, scrappy, there we go, a scrappy Zerg who might be able to take a, you know, a fight that he has to punch above his weight class, but we'll see. Rainer is actually the one going for an early pool, but it is, you know, Perhaps a little bit safe as well, but it's going to come with that faster gas. It's going to be a lot faster speed. What made you guys expect rain around Blackburn? I don't think we did, actually. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure when they were discussing it, they were expecting a Terran. Um, I don't remember exactly, though. So Radita was like, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but I think this works out for, uh, for us as well. Mm -hmm. And I know okay. Radita's actually been like really thinking about his games too. And that's what I really liked from a lot of my players is that they're like not just talking to each other. But they're also coming up with uh, strategies and thinking about what would work. I'm not sure Radito would expect this from Rainer, though. Nope. Well, Rainer obviously opening up with a gas and a very quick baning nest here. So Rainer is actually going to be the aggressive one. Maybe he feels that as long as he can bring the fight to the other side of the map, then his mechanics should be able to carry him through. He's been playing quite a bit. I feel even after Katowice, I saw him in the 2v2 tournament that uh, Wadi was covering as well. He was having a very good time and he looked on point. He was very confident in talking and microing at the same time. So I think my boy is kind of feeling it. And Ratta really needs to figure this out. And so far, he ain't figuring out a whole lot. Okay, he's got one little Zergling sneaking into the main base. This could be big for Ratata. He stopped using his Ling for a hot second. It's going to see the Banling Nest, which is great news. But can Radata actually defend? Uh, that's that's the question. That's going to be difficult to do. Um, he knows he has to, but mm -hmm. th like the, the build is already in motion here. And I'm even worried about that Banling Nest. Not that I don't think it's going to be sniped. Not really a high priority for Rainer, but the timing of it. Ay, ay, ay. That's going to make life difficult. Radata, no, already losing one of these queens. I don't think he expected it to attack already. All right, Romiti gets one queen. Romiti gets what he wants, and he surrounds the second queen as well. And the Banelings are still very healthy. That was pretty good by Radata, but there are still so many links. That's a good Baneling connection, and we should be able to get on top of these drones. We're going to get queen number three as well. And the Admirals are completely back in it, Zombie Grove, because I love where this is going. Down 0-2. We won't go down without a fight. This is... Uh, Looking like potential game-ending damage. Rainer is running up behind this, and it is game-ending damage. And just like that, in our very first battle, we are going to the decider match. And, well, that was short, but very sweet, if you ask me. Yes. Yeah, sweet for you, 100%. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think Radito was probably thinking more of like a mid-game attack from his side. I'm actually not sure what exactly his build was uh, going to be, but he definitely wasn't expecting Rainer to be the aggressive one. So... I mean, you know, he's on edge, obviously, with the late hatchery being scouted, but he's not exactly sure what that's going to mean. 
uh, especially on Blackburn, where I guess gold-based stuff can kind of play a part, but not not in that particular game. And then and then he did scout it. I was actually quite confused by his queen movement. Yeah, it was a bit adventurous. Maybe he thought that Raynor was going to spend some time on just cancelling the third hatch. Mm. And maybe just use the links to cancel the third hatch and then try to get adventures with the banelings into the natural. And then maybe the queens were able to get a lucky pick off on the banelings. Maybe that was the thought process, but... I'm just happy Rainer is keeping his word to me, you know? I'm, I'm getting a little worried sometimes. I, I don't know what the boys have done in their little ski trip. I'm like, oh my goodness, I hope they didn't corrupt my captain. But it seems that uh, Rainer is still Rainer, and that makes me very happy. Yeah, yeah, he's still good. He's still good. Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe that third base was supposed to be a, a time buy, but that seems like an awfully... Is it... <laughs> I, I think that's usually not effective. I, I would guess anyways that Rainer would almost never go for that third hatchery. And then it's also one of the like least, um, I, I don't know how to say it. Like the hatchery so far away that it's even less likely they're gonna go for that third hatchery. So I think you're right, just missed timing when the Ling's actually go into the natural. It is what it is, ZVZB like that sometimes. Now we got ourselves another Terran versus Protoss. And in the top left, it is my player. The green Protoss, Skilos. And in the bottom right side, we're looking at the main base of my third round draft pick. The best Chinese player of all time. It's time. I love this one on paper, Zombie Grub. Like, time Skilos, I feel that is truly 50-50. I don't know how you feel about that, but... I think Skillers has been doing very well in some of the weekly tournaments lately. I uh, absolutely love the kit. Uh, he actually stopped by my house a couple of weeks ago, like two, three weeks ago. He was here playing some games from this setup. Uh, but time is always fun to watch as well. Never really a boring game with time either. 50-50 if you ask me. I think this could truly really go either way. I think so as well. The only reason I have a bit more confidence actually in my player is that time did not have a great TVP showing last uh or this week actually or maybe it was last week i forget which now but it just it was not even that he lost against a protoss player that i expected him to do okay against it's that he lost quite one-sidedly it was it was just a lot of like early game pushes that fell mm -hmm. flat on their face so it's the only reason that i'm a little more confident for skillless but absolutely if you look at this on paper i think maybe even time might even be considered favored Maybe it depends on like what uh, server they're playing on. Yeah, I'm not sure which one this is played on. I mean, there is a good chance that the series you're talking about, if that was on the Monday night, then he's playing from Los Angeles on the European server, though. So those, you know, that's often uh, oh, okay. when. Yeah, obviously this game is fair, of course. I mean, that makes sense, Wadi. But if Time was play Time did play in some of the European Pro Tour weeklies, and if he plays in Dulls, then it doesn't matter if he's playing from Los Angeles or China or whatever. He's going to have to play on the European server. And then I do understand that if you're playing TVP, that you may be trying to get the job done early, because the longer the game goes, the worse it gets for a Terran if they have, like, 150 or 200 ping. That's a good point. That's a good point. I still think that it was really... It, it was quite it was quite shocking because otherwise time seemed to be doing totally fine on the European server. Obviously he's been playing on the weekly, so he's not too bothered by it. Uh, and then he's been winning, you know, other matches where I thought that ping would be more of an issue. Like some of his TVTs, I was quite amazed with how he controlled it. So I, I don't really know where to place time right now. All I know is that this is this is dicey for both of us. There's absolutely a chance that Skillless wins, chance that time wins. Only time will tell. Um, but the Twilight Council is coming down for Skillis, and time seems like he's going into a typical 1-1-1. I think we can already kind of bury the hatchet, does on we We both got two points on the board. <laughs> it's been nice, right? This has been a good way to kick off the cast of Civil War, if you ask me. It's, yes, actually, this is much better. As cool as it would have been for you, Thermal, to get that 3-0. No, no, no. A little, a little more disappointed than the overall. <laughs> There'd be absolutely nothing cool about that. I would actually be proper sad. <laughs> like, it's starting <laughs> off 0-3 after hyping this all up, getting ready to take down Benny and the boys. No, 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 that, that would not have been very cool. All right, so we're going to have Blink on the way for Skillers. As time is just cruising around with a Reaper and a Heli and trying to get some scouting done. Skillers is going to prevent that with a full pylon in the back of his natural. We don't mind drop against Blink opener. The last time we saw that, it went very good for the Terran, but I think that was slightly different because Max Pax went up to four gateways and was moving out. I don't feel that Skillers wants to move out as he's taking all of his gases. Ah, that's a good point. 
That's a very good point, actually. So, I mean, we're playing on Berlingrad, so that shorter a map can feel a little more... More claustrophobic, perhaps, for the Protoss player, if they're not choosing the aggressive build anyways. Which Skillis is not, with all the gas being taken, going up to that high technology. Colossus. Uh, time would love to be able to scout this. Already scouted in the third base timing. And he actually scouted at least one of the gases being put down. Mm. Some good all intel. right. So Skillis' units are on patrol at this point. Most of them are actually in the front. If that, if that Widowmine drop just fully goes for it, there is a good chance that, worst case scenario, we're going to get two probes and love lost mining time. Blink is not totally done yet. Skillis not quite responding. Okay, there we go. He does pull. He's going to end up losing two or three workers there. A little bit of splash damage. I mean, not terrible for the Protoss, but also not too bad for time because he saved the Metafac. If you don't lose the Metafac, I think these kind of traits totally okay for a Terran. Yeah, agreed. Totally expected as well. This is one of the more usual ways I would say it happens. But like I was saying, time probably knows like what's going on, but he also scouts the robotic space. Now he really knows what's going on. Uh, so that later third base, get a lot of protection. You feel safe with the blink into Colossus. Um, but I'm going to be really curious to see how he, he defends against Time's Harassment. Obviously, he has Blink. There's opportunities to defend against drops, harassment, actually get out on the map and even do a little bit of his own poking, which he's doing now with the Stalkers. But Time, one thing we've always given him credit for is that his multitasking can be insane. Oh, whoa! What? Oh, that is an aggressive Blink! Yeah, imagine if that tank was just a little bit close. The Stalkers still need to get out of there, though. Skillers really wants that depot. He said after you to that depot in particular, now ends up losing a stalker as well. I mean, I'll trade a depot for a stalker all day, every day. We can drop those down from the skies anyway, so I don't hate that for time. Only cost us like 250 minerals, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it definitely was a bit bold from Skillis, so I guess Saul the tank was far enough away, and that might have been like his go, no go kind of situation. But I don't think it was uh, actually worth it. Not the worst thing, though. Skillis still very comfortably getting up to his three bases, and he is going to be comfortable it's just for now. Like when time pushes, though, and it might not actually be too many drops, we have some tank production, could just be one, again, gut punch to the third base, kind of like we thermal. Uh, style, I suppose, that we saw earlier today. But one drop is being sent out. Sneaky deaky like with the observer still haven't been killed, hoping that it wasn't there to see that. It was not. But this pylon might. Pylon might, but it can pull units out of position and that kind of opens up the map for these buy units and the tanks to potentially go to the other side. Skillers does see this move out with his observer though. Very important that we don't have the mana vex to expose. There you go. I love that, the little touches. But Skillers actually here with his army in the center of the map. That's pretty crazy. I think he wants to drop a couple of force fields and he does. We tried to get a Colossus there. That didn't totally work out for time. We lost a lot of Marines and he's still chasing with just the three Marauders. But we do have a little drop in the back of the third getting a probe or two perhaps a stalker it's something yeah actually uh, and time still finding the opportunity to position himself very aggressively and actually it looks like skillis has lost track of the army to a certain degree a probe uh -oh. scouts it but the tanks are going to siege up not awfully close to the production line but close enough that it is going to be worrying real quick some zealots being warped in would help they do have charge so clean uh -oh. up the freaking medevac and uh, get some charge less warped in <laughs> I kind of want time to go home, man, because, yeah, these tanks, we saw that earlier as well. If five or six zealots get on top of them, and with just a couple of marauders, we're going to have a very hard time keeping those tanks safe. So I'm happy that he went home when he did. Skillers is still in a pretty good economic position, though. Up 13 workers is not bad. He's this only single fort, so that gives me a lot of hope. And time, it seems like he's going to play a relatively defensive game. I've seen Skillers more than once just drop a Templar Archives, get a War Prism, and then go for it with a lot of Gateway Units, two, three Colossus, and a couple of Archons. I think the timing like that could be powerful here as well, but with this many tanks, maybe he won't do it. That would be the issue, the amount of tanks that are popping out. But Skillis, I think, again, like, with that knowledge, his observer just got killed, but he still got that knowledge, saw the setup, uh, knows that maybe he could bully a little bit, just to make sure that you're, like, ready to evacuate, never actually pull the trigger, and then get a fourth base, maybe double forge behind it, too. Uh, basically, I think we're getting to another, like, macro TVP, where I'm feeling more comfortable from, for my Protoss, <laughs> just like the, the Showtime game earlier on. Um, not to say that time's mid or late game is faulty, just that Skillis, I think, is protect himself from scarier elements, and now he might even get to be the bully a little bit. Oh, that's a very fast start, dude. 
Yeah, it's, the Skillis is doing a lot of things, man. Look, I look at this production tab and I'm like, so how many bases are you on, mate? Seven? Because this is a lot of stuff for a three and a half to four base Protoss. And Jeez. that could actually maybe be his downfall. He's even getting a proxy gateway in the bottom side as well. Now firing up plus one air weapons already. I think time is going to keep this game relatively simple for himself. And as it's getting close to max out, then move out with all these tanks, all these liberators. The first is Raptors on the way. I am surprised. This is like one of the very few games where I actually think Archons would have been godlike and Skillers doesn't have any Archons. Oh, no, 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 oh. no, 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 no. Maybe away from the tanks, yes, but that was a very deadly engage. That actually might have just cost Skillis the game. He can't get around, so the army's gonna pounce on him now, and Skillis is caught in a very Die. odd situation. Yeah, uh, this Ruptor is gonna try and save the day, but this was this was all types of awkward. <laughs> there is a shield battery overcharged though, that kind of scares me. So we're gonna have to disengage for a split second. There are two two upgrades on the way, so it's not like time is ultra all in. But as long as we can prevent Zealots from getting on top of these tanks, I want to say I think we're oh, good. That is an ambitious boy. forward blink. What the hell is that? Skill us. There's a lot of Marauders here. There's a lot of tanks. The Zealots are putting in some decent work, but time is getting very good trades. Stalkers are stuck. A couple of extra Zealots show up, but the reinforcements have arrived for my boy time. And I'm really starting to like this now, Zombie Grub. Yeah. Yep. Uh, agreed. <laughs> that's, that's good for time. I mean, Skillis almost maybe could have redeemed himself if he had not taken that last fight as well. Um, but with that last fight, I think that might be the uh, point of no return. Yeah. He's invested so much into things now that he's not going to use, like the Stargate and the plus one. I guess mm -hmm. his idea was that he's going to buy so much time that maybe he could like just buy almost an infinite amount of time and get to Stargates and like maybe expecting a slower game. But, I mean, what time is doing on Burligrad makes a ton of sense. Actually getting his tanks across the map doesn't take all that long. Zealots are causing some havoc in the third of time, but unless the Disruptor pops off, how is Skillis going to take on this army? Yeah, this Bioball is still very big, so a couple of Zealots is not that intimidating anymore. The Disruptors are still a little bit intimidating, and Skillis did manage to save most of his probes of that base that went down. So this is not one of these moments where we can just disengage, go home and be happy. Because if we do that, and Skillis gets another base up, he's still forward. Oh my goodness, time. You're funking with my heart over here, but that worked out. Now we're going to pick up the last few Zealots. I want to say I think we have it, but, you know, Protoss is pretty good zombie grub, so I'm not too sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe Protoss power can bring it back, but Skillis is down to two disruptors. Oh, He's going to try and move in and gets obliterated by the tanks. Uh, I think his position was totally fine before he took that engagement, and that engagement was just like the real unraveling, because then he also couldn't get home. If he could get home and defend a base, maybe he still has a second chance of life, but... Oh. And you can see, like, even towards some of these, like, very, very one-sided last engagements, the supplies weren't terrible, but they didn't have the position, didn't have their correct units. GG. I'm so proud of my children. I'm a little <laughs> emotional right now, Zombie Grub. Bringing it back already in the opening match of the season. Down 0-2. But that's the fighting spirit that I was looking for. I love it. What a great way to kick off the cast of Civil War. I don't think it could really be any better, Zombie Grub.